takes a lot of energy, a lot of passion um, and a lot of work. So thank you on behalf of everyone who's here. I see a lot of these thank yous coming through in the chat and I would encourage you to reach out and say a nice, just a little personal thank you to someone that you come across on, on the organizing committee today. It means a lot. So I can now share my screen, which is brilliant. And I will get this going. I really like the, um, can you see, can you see a normal screen there? Just want to double check. Perfect. Cool. Um, so Jeff, we can see your notes. Um, we're seeing your speaker okay. notes. Yeah. No yeah. worries. We can bring that that way. That better. There we go. Okay, cool. All right. Let me just move the camera over here. And we are good to go. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. So I, I was, um, I was chatting to Rebecca, about this a while ago when we were trying to organize this face to face and I know that you guys are really gutted that it's not face to face but I'm even more gutted because you know you live there right <laughs> I I would have got to visit you again and I as as Rebecca said I, I I've been involved with Sugar Sugsa for a while you know I I was um I was lucky enough to speak to you guys back in I think 2013 2014 something like that um, and it was awesome and it's just been getting better and better and the I love the theme I love the theme of simplicity and so I was even though I've never done a talk on simplicity before I was inspired to to, to create a talk on on simplicity simply because I think it's a fantastic theme really really timely given where we are in the world right now and so my goal for you this morning is to talk to you about a few aspects of simplicity first of all why it's important why it's why it's beneficial Indeed, I mean, it's a competitive advantage if we can get it right, but also that it's really quite difficult to get simplicity right. And if we get it wrong, it can be a little bit dangerous. So I'm going to talk about all those things. It would be it would be highly unlikely that you hear a talk over the next two days, possibly over the next two years that doesn't mention the pandemic. So I will touch on that slightly because it, it has undoubtedly affected all of us and it's affected our ability to optimize our levels of simplicity and i think for me that's that's the one message i want you to take away from this it's not about it's not about simplifying it's not about complicating it's about optimizing your level of simplicity because simplicity is a good thing complication can be a good thing so um optimizing your level of simplicity that's that's my aim for you today i'm going to give you a few things that hopefully you can do to help with that so how does simplicity help well I think there are a number of different ways. I'm going to talk you through my personal experiences. So I'll caveat this with this is just Jeff's opinion, all right? And, and Jeff's opinion is not always right. Uh, just ask my wife. The, um, the, first, the first thing I find simplicity really helpful for is, is when I'm solving problems. Now, you might have heard of the term Occam's razor. Um, this, this is something that it's, it's used in all sorts of things. But the first time I came across it was uh, when I was watching House, the TV show with Hugh Laurie. Fantastic, one of my favourite TV shows. Uh, and I think it was, um, it was to do with predicting hypotheses and it's been widely used in, in medical diagnoses. And the, the basic premise of this is that if you've got a problem and you've got a, more than one different hypothesis or prediction around it, then it's usually the one with the fewest assumptions. The simpler explanation is usually the one that's most likely to be correct. And so when you're looking at solving a problem, it can often help just to strip away some of the hypotheses, assumptions that we have. And really tied into that is another principle that you'll probably be aware of, even if, if not by the, 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 the official term, then by some of the more um, sort of colloquial uh, interpretations of it, the Pareto principle or the 80 20 rule um, when i when i was first taught scrum i was taught you now there was there were studies out there that 80 percent of your product's value comes from 20 percent of your product's features this this 80 20 rule 80 percent of the bugs come from 20 percent of the code these types of um sort of heuristics and rules of thumb are not just applicable in software but they're in business in society in sport this 80 20 rule seems to be really quite common and we can take advantage of that uh, and focus on the 80%, the, the, the stuff that's shining out, and it will help us solve a lot of our problems a lot quicker. And I think that's going to be an underlying theme for me today is, is, is focus on what you can focus on, and then the rest will become a little bit easier. Now, I've got a little picture of a Rubik's Cube there. And now, I'm not one of these people who can close their eyes and you know do it in 20 seconds, but the fact that there are lots of people out there that can do that tells me that 
when I first saw a Rubik's Cube, I thought, well, that's just crazy. And it you know, took me forever to ever get close to, to solving it. But it is possible and it looks really complicated, but there are patterns. And it doesn't take long for you to, to Google the patterns of solving the Rubik's Cube, right? And once you know that pattern, you can pretty much solve anything. And not just solve it, but solve it in multiple ways. You can actually create multiple different types of solution. So patterns really, really help decomplicate things. Patterns are simple. And patterns have become part of how we do a lot of our agile things. The other thing where simplicity really, really helps me is getting things done. So I, I'm a, a so Rebecca very, very politely and kindly referred to me as an all rounder. Um, that's a nice way of looking at it. Uh, I, 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 I get involved in too many things, right? So I, I, I have very high whip limits uh, quite a lot of the time, which is not something I you know, preach. You know, I'm a, try and practice what I preach but at, at various points in time I think you know what things are getting a little bit crazy I need to simplify and the best thing I do create a list the good old-fashioned back to basics list a checklist where there can only be one priority number one and I get that thing done and then I move on to the next thing and when I get back to basics I get so much more done so much more done and so much more fulfillment from getting those things done. The other thing that's been a big thing for me, certainly over the last 12 months, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of you could relate to some of this, is, is the personal well-being. It's so easy to get over-complicated with our work, with our life. Um, and I was interested in um, looking at whether this was just me and whether there was actually any sort of scientific backing to this. But simplification can help lead to a greater level of personal well-being. So I was doing a lot of research, and it turns out there are a lot of studies. I came across this term, voluntary simplifiers. So a voluntary simplifier is somebody who consciously chooses to live a simpler life, right? So they sort of um, opt out of the, the sort of materialistic um, sort of buying things type world and, and just live on simpler on simpler means now I want to stress I'm not encouraging you to do that right I don't want you to go out and live in the bush and throw away all your possessions or anything like that but just looking at some of these studies they were pretty consistent in finding that people who were voluntary simplifiers had higher levels of what they called personal well-being or life satisfaction and there was one study in particular, Alexander and Ushab from 2012, which found that 87% of people who actually made a conscious move to a simpler life increased their levels of life satisfaction. Now, like I said, you don't need to go and throw away all your possessions, go and live in the bush and forget about everything, but it's just doing a little bit more simplifying. And this is going to sound really perhaps overly simple, but taking a walk, stroking a cat, having a conversation with an old friend. You know, I... It's, we've got loads of technology and technology is amazing, right? And we make use of it. But sometimes just going back to basics really, really has a massive boost. One topic that some of you who've seen me talk before will have heard me mention before um, is decision fatigue. I think it's a huge thing. I find it a really interesting area as well because if you actually took time to look and write down all of the decisions you make, every day you would be overwhelmed so don't do it right but just deciding whether to have a cup of tea in the morning deciding what clothes to wear in the morning deciding how you're going to you know, turn up to work deciding what job you're going to do first every all of these things a lot of them they're automatic and that's brilliant because we have these fantastic brains which allow us to automate a lot of the normal and that actually is is, is imperative to allowing us to function but despite that amazing facility that we have, there are still a lot of things that we actually spend time, spend energy, spend stress on making decisions about that we probably don't need to. So you've probably heard of Steve Jobs and Barack Obama and all these other people who just don't choose what to wear in the morning. Yeah, their wardrobe is full of the same outfit and they just put on a clean black turtleneck, right? It's, it's not because they don't have any fashion style. It's simply because that's one more decision they don't have to make. That's one more, amount, one more ounce of energy that they don't have to spend on a decision that they can then use for something more important. So whatever, I'm not saying that you should always wear the same clothes every day, all right, I need to stress this, but just look at something that you think, you know what, I don't need to make that decision. I'm just gonna automate that, all right? 
and just free up that energy for something more valuable, more important, more impactful for you. Just make it a little bit simpler. Again, Rebecca in her lovely introduction said that my, I, I, I see myself as a coach first. That's where I get most joy. That's where I spend most of my time. And I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it. Um, however, I was talking to um, talking to my supervisor the other day, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't what I went to supervision for, but it, it came up as a result of a conversation about how quite often people um, come to me, and when when we when they've been coaching, they come to me for all sorts of different reasons, but quite often they'll describe it as Jeff. Do you know what that that felt a bit like therapy? And I said, well, that's interesting because I'm you know deliberately not a therapist. I I, I draw really clear lines where therapy is and where coaching is. I said, yeah, but it felt like it. I said, have you ever had therapy? He said, no, no, but that's what I expect it to feel like. So talk to them a little bit more about that. I said, well, do you know what? I just don't think I've ever had anybody actually really, really listen to me at work before and just genuinely inquire without being nosy. And so that's, that's a sign that sometimes I'm doing a good job, I think, all right? But even when I'm doing that, I can find myself being pulled towards using a really fancy coaching process or, you know, a really cool coaching tool or technique. You know, I get dragged into feeling that now and again I need to earn my stripes as a coach or just do something more. Uh, and sometimes that's, that's, that's brilliant. Sometimes it works out really, really well. But more often than not, I'm overcomplicating it. And all I need to do as a coach, all I need to do, all I need to do is just listen to someone and just inquire genuinely the basics go back to basics the basics of coaching just listen and genuinely inquire um so that that's just a sort of little reminder that i have a little post-it note on my wall just listen and inquire moving slightly away from me and more into the more organizational work that i do one of my favorite quotes that i had i used to use a lot i used to actually share with people a lot was um, by the author of the book, The Little Prince, a you know, famous book, some of you have probably read. If you haven't, it's, it's a cool book. Um, and I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong, so please forgive me, but Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, all right. Uh, he talks about the difference between um, simplifying your message and overcomplicating your message, being specific or being visionary. So his quote is, if you wanna build a ship, don't drum up people to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Now, when, um, when, when Kwesi was, was giving her metaphor of, uh, of the songs and the, the understanding of the lyrics underneath it, it just brought this back to me again, because when you want to engage people, you don't really detail things. You tell them the essence you hook into the essence and then you leave some blanks for them to fill in for themselves. You let them personalize the message. You let them see themselves in what we're talking about. If you over-specify something, you take up all the space for people to join in. So whether that's the corporate narrative, whether that's you know a sprint goal, or whether that's user stories. You know, the, for anyone that's used user stories, I'm sure you'll find the best user stories are generally the simpler ones. They're not the ones that take up two or three pages of A4 with all the edge cases, all the happy and sad paths and you know, the details. It's, this is a user. They have this need. This is why it's really important to them for this need to be solved. And this is why we are in a great place to help them. That's it. That, that gets people going. That increases our sense of well-being. That increases our sense of engagement. So we try not to over, over, over complicate. And then when, how do we know we're doing a good job? You know, this is one of the big, never answerable questions really for someone in our, in our world. It's very difficult to know if we're doing a good job, if we're scrum mastering a team, if we're coaching a team, if we're leading an organization through a never ending journey of, of organizational cultural change, how do we know we're making progress? And again, it's really easy to come up with some complicated metrics. And sometimes that's the case, that's, that's important because actually we are working in a complex and complicated world and there are nuances that we need to take into account. But ultimately when it comes down to it, the only metrics that matter are, is this done or is it not done? Does it work or does it not work? 
is my customer happy or are they not happy? Do I feel better or not? The really simple metrics are the ones that, that really, really matter. Um, and just stripping it back to that, I think, is a, is a really big personal and competitive advantage. So those are the things that I think where simplicity helps. All right. So problem solving, getting things done, engaging people, your personal well-being, decision fatigue, coaching people, stories and tracking progress. But I, I want to know what you think. Now, I'm not going to ask you to, to put yourself out there verbally. If you feel like adding something into the chat, then please do. But more importantly, I want you to, if you've got something that you can write on, whether it's digital or, or um, even more simple, pen and paper, I just want you to have a think about yourself. So there are two questions on the screen there. Pick one or the other or both if you want and just think, do you know what? It would be great if I could simplify my work. And here's why. It would be really useful if I could simplify my work because, and then whatever that means to you. I'm not going to ask you to share that with anybody. If you want to share it with other people to inspire them, brilliant. The other one is, is not necessarily work but life. So it would be great if I could simplify my life because what benefit would that give you? Okay, Because the benefits it gives me, meaningless. What would it give you? It's the only reason that you would have for doing anything to simplify. I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds of simple silence. Cool. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't install this font on this machine. Um, and that's an example of overcomplication. But unfortunately, simplicity, just because we've said it's good, doesn't mean it's easy. Um, and I love this quote from Mark Twain, although whether it was from Mark Twain or not, he's, he's one of those people like uh, Benjamin Franklin that you find so many quotes attributed to him on the internet that most of them aren't. But hey, um, you can do your own uh, fact checking. So this idea of I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead, you know, which on, on the face of it is quite paradoxical. It's, it's quite weird. But if you think about it, simplifying a message takes time. Boiling it down to its essence takes time. Um, and if we don't take our time, we end up waffling. We end up uh, over delivering, but not necessarily value. So why, why is simplifying difficult? Well, first of all, we're clever. So one of the fantastic things that we have about us as a species is our intelligence. But unfortunately, we're also intelligent. And because we're intelligent, we feel, often unconsciously, we need to use it. And so there's an element of, well, this can't be this simple. You know, I've done all this training. I've got all this knowledge. I've got to use it. Um, there must be more marks available for this question in the exam. You know? So we tend to overcomplicate first, whether it's to prove ourselves, whether it's because we're insecure, whether it's simply because we just like to use our intelligence. But then once that, that complication is out there, it's really difficult to unpick. And yet Agile is telling us, start with the simplest thing that would possibly work. What's your MVP? What's, what's, the, what's the first iteration? But that's really difficult for all of us. It's a normal thing. Um, we like to future-proof. We hate the idea of waste. I'm not the only person out there that, that hates the idea of having to do the same thing more than once, having to go back and redo something, rework, waste. We hate that. And we're always quite demanding as a species. And again, that's a good thing because that encourages us to progress. All right? We want more. And that is a good thing. But we want more now. And there's always someone who wants something extra. Another thing that we tend to have in common as a species is we don't like saying no. We can always rationalise why it's a good idea to add that little bit extra in. It delays things, it overcomplicates things. Uh, and every feature that we have not only costs us to deliver it, but costs us to support it as well. I, I have this recollection of the analogy of the magpie going around collecting shiny things. But when I'd started trying to find an image for this slide, I really struggled. So it got me thinking, is that is that a thing? Or is that just 
me? Is that just something I picked up from my childhood about magpies going around stealing shiny things? Maybe it was a story I heard and it's just not a thing. Um, but so whether or not you you have this shit, same metaphor and analogy as me, I really don't know. But um, regardless of whether you are, so you're a magpie or not, there's probably a good chance that if you you know you go up into your attic or your basement or your you know, storage um, facility, you've got a lot of stuff. All right, we tend to pick things up and collect things and hoard things as we go through life. And there's a couple of really valid reasons for that. We, we attach sentimental value to things. They evoke memories and memories evoke positive feelings and so on. There's also the, the, the economical effect of the endowment effect, which means that once we own something, we place a higher than objective value on it. So no one is ever going to offer us what we think it's worth to take it away. And we can't bring ourselves to throw something away because we see value in it. So it's very difficult. But not only do we collect and hoard things, we also collect and hoard people and projects and commitments and obligations. And we find it really hard to let go. This idea of a sunk cost fallacy. I've put energy and effort and investment, sometimes financial, sometimes emotional, into this, this thing, this relationship, this project, this commitment. And if I let go now, all that effort is wasted. This is that sunk cost fallacy. We have an obligation factor of, well, I don't want to let people down. You know, I, I've set myself up as somebody who doesn't, doesn't quit. All right. There are all sorts of reasons why we hold on to things, why we hoard things, why we store things. And they're not bad, all right? but just as we would tell a product owner, you know, they need to ruthlessly prioritize, there's no point having 10,000 items on your product backlog, we probably need to do a little bit of that ruthless prioritization ourselves all right and anybody who's actually gone through a little bit of a of a of a purge with regards to their you know, their old belongings generally speaking the feel the, the feelings that I, I, I people tell me about are positive it felt good to cleanse some of the things that we don't need anymore to let go but we have that sort of emotional mental barrier to get over we also procrastinate Okay, another very, very common human trait. Um, and procrastination is not necessarily a bad thing. All right, we're actually leaving things to the last responsible moment is a good thing. We know this from an agile perspective. Um, and sometimes if we don't do something, we actually turn out we don't need to do something. The, the, the need or the problem disappears. But by procrastinating, we, we tend to let things pile up on us. Now, that has a couple of different problems for us because first of all our mind is now not focused on what we're doing but it's also focused on the things that we know we should be doing and want to be doing okay so we, we have a split focus even if it's in the back of our mind it's just eating away at oh I should be doing my homework but you know I'm doing this really important thing not really important it's a displacement activity but still it's important so that there, there's that split focus and that has a negative impact because the more we split our focus, the less stuff we get done. Going back to my list thing. It also causes us stress because we start feeling guilty. All right? And that guilt of not doing the things that we should be doing or seeing that list pile up feeds that cycle. And we also start making mistakes because we're not focused, which takes, means things take longer, which means we lead things to pile up even more and it feeds the cycle so it's all very well and good saying let's simplify but if we procrastinate we're just making things harder for ourselves and we do have a tendency to do that but the biggest the number one reason i think simplifying is hard for most people and this is based again just purely on my own personal experience okay i don't have any empirical foolproof data to back this up just from my own personal experience is that most people don't know what their mission is all right now you've probably heard of warren buffett whether or not you agree with how he made his money or whatever um, he said something that the difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say no to almost everything now having a personal mission knowing what you do and why you do it allows you makes it a lot easier for you to say no it allows you to focus on what's really important 
and say to the other things, do you know what? That's great, but it's not what I'm aiming for. It's not going to get me closer to my mission. And again, if you think about it, we're all agile people, right? We talk about the importance of vision. We talk about the importance of prioritization. We talk about these concepts for our work, but do we do it for ourselves? So I'd ask you, do you know why you're doing what you're doing? Do you know what you stand for? Okay, another one of my fav favorite quotes, and I'm, again, you can probably find lots of different people who this quote's attributed to, but if you don't stand for something, you could fall for anything. So maybe, I don't know what your mission is, right? Maybe it's to create one great team at a time to help them create one great product at a time. Maybe it's to coach people to realize the great strengths and potential they have. Maybe it's to become the most respected agile voice in South Africa. Maybe it's to develop empowerment and resilience in people, teams, and companies. Whatever your personal mission is, think about what it is and then simplify it because you'll probably write something a bit too long, first of all, and put it somewhere. Right, that you can see. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but just before I do, one good way of simplifying is recap. So simplifying is difficult because it's an insult to our intelligence. We have a desire to future-proof and we always want more. We hoard things, we collect things, whether or not you're a magpie or not. And most people don't know what their mission is. Again, that's what I think. I don't know about you. But I'm going to challenge you. Maybe this will be really easy for you. Maybe it'll be really difficult. I don't know. But again, I'm not going to ask and put anybody on the spot. If anybody wants to share their output to this in the chat, brilliant. Okay. If not, share it with somebody else or just do it for your own personal benefit. But I want you to think about what is your mission. Now, it can help to split this out between your professional mission and your personal mission because we are not all our jobs. All right. Not all of us have a job that is also our life's purpose, and that's okay. But we can have a professional mission and a personal mission. So I want you to think about what that is and write that down. If you want to do one, if you want to do both, that's up to you. Again, I'm not going to check on you. But again, another 10 seconds of simple silence to get your thought process going. also said simplicity is dangerous so while it's very very good it is very difficult but just because something's difficult doesn't mean it can't be achieved and often the things worth achieving are difficult but you should also be aware that trying to simplify comes with risks it would be unprofessional and unethical of me to encourage simplicity without giving you the traditional warning signs. So why is simplicity dangerous? Well, we all have cognitive biases. Now this is very much linked to my, my comment earlier on about, um, uh, about the idea that we, we, we see things as we are. Right? We don't see the world as it is, unfortunately. We see everything through our own lens. And our brains, like I said earlier, our brains are brilliant at simplifying for us. Okay, they allow us to connect patterns, they allow us to, to automate, they allow us to, to basically function without getting overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that's going on. And we try and filter out stuff, well we have to filter out stuff, we try and filter out things that are important, that we think are important, we try and filter out things that are unimportant, we try and filter uh, things that if, we, if, we're, if we're familiar with then we don't need to pay a lot of cognitive effort to, to deal with. But unfortunately, because of all these filters that we have through our own lens, we might not always be the best judge of what can or should be simplified. So inviting people in to our simplification process can be a really powerful way of mitigating this potential danger. But if we're just doing it ourselves, we tend to we don't know where our blind spots are. Another risk is that we choose easy. Okay, now I mentioned about Occam's razor earlier on, and one of the main criticisms of that as a sort of philosophical tool or a practical tool is that it gets misapplied. 
and that's largely through laziness all right now the main misapplication of Occam's razor is that they try and compare two different predictions rather than two hypotheses for the same prediction so we're not comparing different things and looking for the easier option that that's kind of a form of denial if you like but it's quite easy for us to rationalize that or misunderstand things so telling ourselves that we need to simplify could be a good excuse for us to take the easy way and to be honest when things are stressful who doesn't want the easy way now and again now I know I can be very very guilty of oversimplification and I can point to the agile principle of simplicity as a nice get out all right but really what I'm doing in those times is making an excuse for myself to not be diligent or thorough and I know I can be guilty of that so I'm aware that that's a blind spot which is a starting point so I can Im involve other people in my process to help me see where that's happening whether that's a coaching supervisor whether that's being part of a collaborative team whether it's just running it by my wife whatever whatever works to help me make sure that I'm not just choosing the easy way all right because simple isn't always easy simple is quite often very hard all right but it's worth it Again, I'm talking a lot about my own personal um, fallibilities here. I'm very guilty of, of not refactoring often enough. I'm a, I'm a big fan of moving on, getting something done and moving on. And this, I'm sure some of you will have will have come across. Um, so Quasi also mentioned the term resistance. You know, we will we will experience all sorts of resistance when trying to help an organization, when trying to help a team. And then we are trying to help them, right? We're not trying to impose something on them that's not going to be beneficial. We want to offer them something that will be useful to them. But one of the concerns, and there are many valid concerns about an agile approach, one of them is, well, you're just going to do something barely sufficient and then you'll never go back and make it good enough. Okay, so if you've met somebody who's really conscientious, who's you know, so probably in a... You know, a, a QA type role or something like that, whose job is to make sure that you know we we do things that work. Then their their concern will be is you're going to strip this right back to something that's barely sufficient, and you're never going to add in all the stuff that we need to make sure this is you know satisfies all of the the criteria that we need. And I think that's the same for life. You know, it, it is a big risk that we don't we move on to the next highest priority feature and we don't go back and make that next thing good enough. All right, get it to done done so that happens at work it happens in our projects but also happens in our life are we disciplined to go back and actually refactor the simple decisions that we've made early on just to get us going um, if not it's the equivalent of writing some some crappy code and, and not going back and refactoring now in our projects we have the opportunity for a you know a rewrite project or a um, a technical um, redesign but in our lives that's a lot more traumatic so making sure that we go back to refactor that that can help now we can put some practices in place to help with that the other thing is we have an amazing ability to cope and I think you know the last 12 months have been a really uh, shone a real spotlight on how adaptable we are as a species we have a fantastic ability to build coping mechanisms or workarounds for all of the daily suboptimizations sub that we make, right? And it's brilliant because it allows us to function, it allows us to keep going. We say, right, okay, well, I can, I can deal with that, and I'll come back to that later. Sometimes that's unconscious. Sometimes we aren't even aware that we've built a coping mechanism or a workaround, and it's, it's kind of like that metaphorical ostrich sticking their head in the sand because eventually those coping mechanisms won't work anymore. But by then, it's become such a big thing that it's going to be a huge deal to actually address it whereas if we'd have just done a little bit more continual refactoring continual simplification it would have served us so much better over time so our ability to cope can actually be our undoing and sometimes we need to look at the little things that we've put in place to help us cope and say well i probably need to remove that right now okay whatever that might be whether that's a buffer in our system or, or what have you. So we see the world as we are. 
we choose easy, we don't refactor, and we cope. All reasons why simplification can be dangerous. Now I've built some flags, some triggers, and some, some positive uh, mechanisms in to try and help me notice when I've oversimplified. But that's going to be my next challenge to you, and I'm not I'm not expecting you to, to, to solve this straight away, but get into the habit of thinking, how will I know if I've oversimplified? Because oversimplification can be as dangerous as overcomplication. Are there any triggers that you could set? Are there any flags that you could look for? Any signs that you could keep an eye out for that would suggest that perhaps you've oversimplified? This is only going to be your first iteration. Okay, these flags, these triggers, they will emerge and evolve as you reflect, as you do and reflect. So again, 10 seconds just of simple silence for you to think, I'll know I've oversimplified if. Okay, so how's the pandemic affected things? I would suggest, again, only speaking from my own experience here, but I've seen quite a lot of people who have reacted to this in very different ways. The whole cliche of you know a challenge is an opportunity type thing has actually played itself out in my experience. I've seen some people that have taken the challenge that the pandemic has thrown at them as an opportunity to simplify. You know, something that they know they'd always really wanted to do, but they'd never really found the time for. Whereas other people have really focused more on the extra challenges and the complications that it's brought up. So we've seen more challenges, whether it's you know, we've got our, our kids are homeschooling at the same time as us, or we haven't got a, a work set up uh, in, our, in our house, or you know, we haven't got the bandwidth or the tools. We've had to deal with difficult and quite rapidly changing rules for how to operate in society whether that be from lockdowns to social distancing to wearing of masks to washing our hands or whatever that they're changing right and regularly changing we've got to deal with different working environments quite a lot of people now over the course of the last more than 12 months have started new jobs have changed teams trying to get to know people through less than optimum or less than habitual methods and we've all had to get to learn some new tools. I mean, I have to be honest. That introduction from uh, from from the from the Sugsa team this morning of how to use these tools was brilliant. Made it so easy to find these different tools and techniques and do sorry not tools and techniques different tools um, like Miro and Zoom breakout rooms and the Code of Conduct all in one place making it so easy for people but we've got to learn all these different things and they're always changing right there's always another new tool that's coming out but if we look at the other side of things we've probably had to travel less we've had to commute less that's simplified things we've focused a lot more on what's been going on in our local area and our local uh, bubble um, the fact that I don't buy the whole idea that we're all in the same boat here because a lot of us have very very different boats um, for, for lots of different reasons, but we are in a very similar situation. So it's been incredibly normalizing to know that pretty much everyone in the world is being affected by the same thing, not in the same way, not to the same level, but to know that this is a, a, a very um, universal experience that we're going through is a, quite a simplest, simplifying factor. And it has enabled us to focus on the simpler things if we choose to all right being able to to have have your have your lunch time at home with your family maybe being able to to stop work and use the time that you would have been commuting for other things being able to get into more of a habitual routine on some of the hobbies that you've always wanted to do whatever it is it has allowed us if we've made the time and the effort to take advantage of the opportunities a chance for a slightly more simple life so what can you do? Right, my challenge to you is, first of all, oh, that didn't work. No, that didn't work, okay. My challenge to you, the little um, 
target at the top is to create a visual reminder of your mission. So what the words that should come up at the top there are focus on your mission. And I want you to place it somewhere, somewhere that you can see all day, every day. So you're probably going to need multiple places, multiple copies of this. One behind your monitor, one on your fridge, one on your notebook, stick one on your tablet as a wallpaper, whatever it is, so that you see it all day, every day, so that you know that whatever you decision you need to make, you can check that against, is it getting me closer to my vision, my mission or not? Um, the next one is uh, identify your simplification rituals. All right. I want to, don't worry, don't worry. I want you to learn to say no. All right, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but it's really important. Don't just do it because Warren Buffett said it. Don't just do it because Jeff said it. Just think about, do I say yes too much? All right, and we need to learn to say no. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because that's really important. I want you to check in with yourself regularly. Ask, am I okay? All right, if you're not, simplify. Eat your frog. All right, what does that mean? It's something that I, you might have seen me tweet about. Again, probably Mark Twain, maybe Benjamin Franklin, who knows? Someone said, if the first thing you do is eat a live frog, then the rest of the day is going to be fine. If you can get that one thing out of the way first thing in your day, the rest of the day is going to be a hell of a lot simpler. And then the other thing I've got is apply the 90% rule. And again, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that now. So saying no, all right, it's really important if you're going to simplify, that you need to get more comfortable with the word no. So you're going to need to practice it. It doesn't come natural. All right. Uh, and it also can help if you've got a few standard phrases up your sleeve. So if nothing else, before, before we worry about saying that, if nothing else, just do one thing. And that is buy yourself a bit of time before answering. When somebody asks you, can you do this? Buy yourself a little bit of time. All right. So maybe having a few standard phrases that could help you say no. You know. I'm always happy to help you, you know that, but this isn't one of those situations. Sorry, I don't have the capacity to do that to the standard you deserve. You know, let me ask this other senior person if they're happy for me to drop what I'm doing to do this instead. You know, I could do that if you could make this other thing disappear for me. You know, I did a, a that little QR code. I, I, I created a little tongue-in-cheek, jokey blog post about polite ways to say no. And it got a lot of attention. So it seems like it's a big thing. So if you wanted a little bit more on that, you can scan that QR code. The other thing is I want you to look at your calendar. So this, this idea of the 90% rule. So this comes from uh, sort of the philosophy of essentialism. What they ask you to do is on a scale of 0 to 10, you can do this with your wardrobe as well. All right? But basically on a scale of 0 to 10, basically ask yourself how essential is each thing in my calendar to achieving my mission. Scale of naught to 10. So 10 is absolutely, it gets me, it's, it's imperative to me achieving my mission. Naught is it's probably taking me away from my mission, right? And the theory of essentialism says if it scores less than nine, it's quite fit and quite, quite strict, your goal is to eliminate it or at least reduce it. Okay, so if you can't eliminate that meeting, maybe you could reduce it from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, all right? So do this for your projects, do this for your non-work stuff, but don't forget, little what we might call fluffy stuff is important now and again. And also looking at your calendar, think about how you can start your working day so that you eat your frogs early. Okay, so look at your calendar and be really ruthless all right, towards your mission. And it won't just be you that benefits, but other people that benefit. So, I'm aware that we've still got a little bit of time in my slot for questions, although we are slightly overrunning overall. I'll let the subs of team decide what to do about that. I'm now open for questions, although I am going to open my window because it's getting warm. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. You have no idea that the comments and the, what was coming through the chat. Uh, just from a personal level, um, everyone, don't worry, the keynote speakers, uh, it is going to be recorded, and I'm certainly going to, to watch this over and over again. They were such amazing pearls of wisdom, but um, personally, the feeling the need to prove, prove one's intelligence, to choose the complicated route, uh, resonated with me. Obviously, the saying no, I've actually named my personal diary saying no, 
Uh, and lastly, actually collecting projects. You know, I didn't really think of I'm a hoarder, but that I also collect tasks and projects the same way that I collect things. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share a feedback tool, but before uh, Google Forms, so if you want to give some feedback to Jeff, please do. But I am going to definitely give some time for questions. So if you do have a question, please pop it in the chat and then we'll ad address it uh, one at a time. So yeah, please uh, put your questions in there now. All right, I have one here. Um, I'm just trying to go there. Can you oh, scroll down a bit? And now my Zoom chat is being silly. All right, can someone else read the excellent? Jeff, there we go. Could you give us an example of a simple story where the readers could add in their own personalized spin? Um, so one, one exercise that I, that I often do is a visualization exercise. Um, and I try and get people to visualize the future. And that, that can be really, really powerful for making change happen, both at a professional level and a personal level. Um, but obviously I can't, I can't just meet someone and, and help them visualize their own story. And perhaps they might not be comfortable reading out their own story to begin with. So I give them an example. All right. And you mentioned my, my podcast and I, um, I talked to, uh, talked to Paul about the idea of, well, we'd often, Paul Goddard and I would often end up in a pub at the end of the day, a working day, and we'd, we'd have a drink and, um, we'd start talking about our day. And we thought at one point, do you know what? It'd be really good if we just recorded this. And cause it's, it, we're always talking about work. We're really sad. We've got no real lives. So maybe, maybe other people would be interested in it, but we were both a bit nervous about it. Paul was a little bit more nervous about it than me. I'm a bit more of a risk taker than he is. And he said, oh, I don't, I don't know about podcasts, Jeff. I'm not really not sure. Um, and we did a bit of sort of risk assessment and things and talked about it, but then I asked him to close his eyes. And so if you fancy it, you can close your eyes. And, um, I said, oh, just imagine that you're on this country path. Okay, in the middle of the English countryside. And you've just finished a 20 minute walk. And you're feeling the, the warm sun on your back. And you can hear the birds chirping. And you can sort of smell the freshly cut grass. And you're oh, feeling a little bit thirsty. So you wander down the road. You're looking at this, this nice greenery on the side of the road. Um, and suddenly you come around the corner and you see you see a pub and you know, the signs there, the name, uh, really nice, warm, welcoming, visual, just just looks like one of those classic, brilliant pubs that you've had some great times in. And so you are brilliant, I'm gonna have a drink. I deserve a drink. I've, I've been work, walking for ages, I'm gonna have a drink. You walk up and there are some people outside that give you that classic nod of, I recognize you, but not really interested in talking to you. Um, and, and you, you go in the pub, immediately greeted with that familiar smell of a pub, that familiar sound of a pub. It's probably been a while since you've been in one, but I'm sure you can remember that, that just that ambiance, that noise, you know, a few people talking, glasses clinking, maybe a little background music, people just chilling, having a drink, having a nice time. Good news, there's nobody at the bar. So you walk straight up and you order your usual and it's surprisingly cheap, you know, half the price of what you'd normally pay. Um, and while you're about to, to order, uh, while you're about to pay, an old friend of yours just calls out your name and you turn around, surprised, but you recognize them. They say, wow, I haven't spoken to you for ages. They beckon you over, you have a sit down, you have a chat, start talking about all the projects that you were used to be involved in, all the good times, all the, 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 the funny failures that you can laugh about now because you know they're in the past. Uh, and before you know it, an hour's gone by and you know, it's time to go. But you've enjoyed it so much that you really wanna make another appointment to, to see them again. Anyway, I'll, I'll cut that short, it's usually a little bit longer. But that story, did, did, did you notice any of the blanks that I left for you to fill in? What was the pub called? Everyone's going to have a different pub name. Mm. Everyone's going to have a different visual picture of that pub because I told them that. What what drink did you order? Yeah. 
What seat did you sit in? Right. So all of those gaps. The, the, I talked about the greenery on the side of the road. I didn't specify a blackberry bush or anything like that. Right. I didn't tell you what my pub was called. I didn't tell you you ordered a pint of beer. I left those gaps. So Mark's ordered a Guinness, right? Not everyone ordered. Someone ordered a gin and tonic, right? So it's you can personalise that story and make it your own, rather than it's my visualisation. I don't know whether that makes sense and helps people. It was really appropriate because there's beautiful birds in the background. <laughs> yes, you can hear that. <laughs> it's stunning. Um, we are at quarter past, but you you've given us such golden nuggets that I'm going to allow for just one quick question. So there's a constant need to improve everything means my to-do list is infinite. Any advice? Um, well, one of the first first um, engagements that I ever had as an Agile coach, I started working with a product owner who, um, who said, I, you know, I get this Agile thing. It seems okay, but my my product backlog is, is quite big. Um, so I don't really know how I'm going to handle that. And I said, okay, so quite big is a relative term how big is quite big uh, and they said it was probably about I don't know, five thousand items or something like that never really counted them i said okay well, that sounds a lot to me but i don't know how many items do your team normally get through you know in a month or something and they said oh, about 12 20 on a good month something like that okay so my maths isn't very good but that sounds like a lot a, a number of years before you'll ever finish any of that right and that's assuming that nothing new comes in in the meantime. So there's a pretty good chance, would you say, that a lot of that stuff will never get done. It's, yeah. So why don't we just delete it? So because people want that stuff. If I deleted it, they'd get annoyed. So, but they're not going to get it. And having that conversation with people, just the, the transparency about, well, this isn't ever going to happen. So is there any point in this being on my list? Um, I'm really simplifying it and saying, well, what's on today's list? So I've got a big list, right? But I've also got today's list. I've got multiple lists, right? I've got the, the, the home DIY list. I've got speaking list. I've got all these different lists. But every day I'll just pull a few things into my today's list. Um, and yeah, the list will never end because we're going to carry on, right? This will only ever end when we end. <laughs> but um, it's, it's getting into a sustainable, manageable pace of managing it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are two minutes over time. So I just wanted to uh, remind you that access to all the rooms and, and the passwords and the links are on the mirror board. I have reshared access to that if you missed it. So just look into the chat. I've also shared the Google form. So please do give Jeff some feedback. Um, it might be intimidated to, intimidating to give our keynote speaker feedback, but I'm sure he invites it just like everyone else. Um, so please do that. So grab some tea, make a wee. Yes, I thought about that beforehand. Uh, and we'll see you in at quarter, <laughs> two, quarter to 11. All before, right. So Before you go, Rebecca, the breakout room yes. in this room is now open. So if there's any rooms you want to join, you can now check your Zoom if you're able to actually go to breakout rooms. If you're not able to go to breakout rooms, that means you do not have the newest version of Zoom. So you can use the break also to update your Zoom. Um, I can always see a lot of collaboration, collaboration on the mirror board. It's amazing. It's amazing. Great. And yes. Thanks, Malena. Also, you just reminded me, um, breakout rooms are only from this link. Okay. So just remember there, the breakout rooms are on the main lobby and the talks are happening in the different tracks. That's it. Remember to <laughs> simplify your life and uh, good luck with the decisions the decisions to choose what you're going to ultimately watch in the next or listen to in the next two days. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yes, perhaps while people are leaving, we do have another opening session tomorrow just to share a little bit more information. Uh, so remember tomorrow morning to also come to this main lobby link.